Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight, sponsored today by Chaos Search. Today, William will be discussing will be discussing data architecture best practices for advanced analytics. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADV Analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the Q&A panel or the chat panel, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists. We may absolutely change it to network with everyone. As always, we will send a follow-up email with two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Courtney from Chaos Search for a brief word from our sponsor. Courtney, hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, it's awesome to be with you guys again. I think this is our third day diversity session this uh, calendar year, and we're really happy to, to be back with the group. And, and William, I'm happy to share some new topics today uh, with you and, and look forward to getting some perspective from our audience here. And um, we'll just do a quick little uh, summary of Chaos Search, who we are, what we do, how we think we are, are at, or know that we are helping organizations know better when it comes to considering modern analytic infrastructures, which will be the topic at hand today. And um, to kick that off, what I would say is the following, hang on one second. What do we do at Chaos Search? We activate the data lake. I'm sure when people think about infrastructure, they talk about lakes and lake houses and fabric and mesh, many of which we'll talk about today. But we activate the data, we activate the data lake for analytics at scale. Um, for organizations looking to analyze multiple types of data, our data lake platform eliminates complexity and helps organizations overcome the challenges posed by costly siloed analytics solutions. We'll go into a little bit more about that, what that means. And for our customers, what can they do? They can perform both search and SQL queries at the same time directly from their cloud object storage. No pipelining, no transformation, no movement. What does that mean for the customers we have noted below? huge reductions in time, cost, and complexity. So for, for us, what that looks like, so the chaos search approach, what we're really looking for, simplicity, elimination of complexity, the ability to constantly scale, and then ultimately reduce costs. So if you look at this architecture, you're, you may be sitting on this call going, oh, I know, yes, I have the log data and OLTP data, and yes, I put that stuff in object storage. It is as simple as it looks when the description here shows that the Chaos Search Data Lake platform connects directly to your object storage. When we do that, we are providing you a single unified version of your data without copying it or moving it in any way. So we're reaching in, we're reading that data set, we're making it available to you. What then happens is that whether you're asking a search question through an Elastic API or a SQL question through any sort of SQL uh, front end tool, by connection through our open APIs, you may use your tool of choice to come into that data set and ask questions. What does that mean for a customer? Besides the simplicity that we've talked about, it allows you to get to answers more quickly without a doubt, but it also allows you to access data of multiple types. So ask different types of questions. This idea of, I have my search data here and I have my SQL data set here and I have ML data sets here. The variety of solutions today that are in the market helping organizations solve for that are many. I, I, I won't, I certainly won't name them here. And what Chaos Search has done is fundamentally disrupt how we think about those data sets by saying that we can access, whether you're asking a search question or a SQL style question, you can do that on the da same data set without change. For use cases, if you think about a lot of our customers today, they start in logs. So they have cloud application infrastructure security, monitoring, troubleshooting, threat hunting style use cases. Those are traditional large volume logs use cases. And where organizations often find themselves maybe falling over with traditional solutions is that you're constantly limited in terms of the amount of data you can retain and therefore troubleshooting, monitoring, or, or looking for any threats without a real lens in terms of perspective can be a, a serious challenge for a cloud ops, DevOps, or a SecOps team. 
With Chaos Search, those limits come off. You're able to look at your data in an unconstrained way because we talked about how it's not moving, it's sitting in your cloud object store. To give you an example of organizations who are seeing a, a benefit, Blackboard, who is now part of Anthology, is an online education business. And uh, their director of DevOps engineering has been a customer of Chaos Search since 2020, when all of a sudden their usage grew by 3,000% with the move to online schooling. Their existing log solution was simply falling over, and there was no way they could support the amount of new activity with the infrastructure they had and the budgets that they had in place. With the move to chaos search, as Joel talks about it, 98% of all the operational burdens have been lifted. Their team can focus on more Blackboard specific tasks, not making the system work or run. What does that really mean for those on the call who are thinking about, well, how do you do that? Well, what was the challenge? They needed to reduce Elasticsearch costs. They needed to figure out, they are architecturally challenged to put as much data as they were generating into their existing Elasticsearch infrastructure. Usage was growing in an, un, you know, an unprecedented way. And users, are, their SREs on their team were spending 10 to 15 hours a week simply maintaining the environment, not helping end users derive answers. They knew they needed a better solution. They turned to Chaos Search because they knew our log solution was going to give them a single access pane of glass. Joel talks about that pretty often, giving them you know, five nines of uptime. And now what can they do? They have complete visibility into their cloud environments at scale. And they can look for app troubleshooting and alerting root cause uh, analyses with a, a long-term view. For some organizations, that could be seven days. That's not long enough to really understand what a root cause may look like. So the impacts were significant. Uptime was improved. They retain much more data. So more than twice the amount of data at half the cost. No movement, no duplication, and they can query on demand. So this benefit of really focusing on value add work, if anyone here works with or participates on an SRE team, hopefully that, that's something that resonates with you. And from a picture perspective, it's as simple as this. If you look at what's on the left with, with Amazon Elasticsearch, you had multiple clusters across multiple regions simply working to get the job done. With Chaos Search, you have a single point of, um, of access within our platform and a dramatic simplification of the footprint. So with that, I hope I've told you enough about how we're helping customers and what we do, but I'd love to know from this audience, if you're out there live today, if you were gonna chime in, what are your greatest challenges? You can pick more than one when it comes to deriving insight from all your data. It's not a polling question. If you choose to answer, I'd love to get a sense for it. It will help us better answer questions at the end of this webcast. Is it expertise or is it more need, need for more data scientists or engineers? Is it resources? Is it tech? Is your architectural, is your analytics platform not set up for scale or is it, is it limiting you in any way? Is it time and always the, the ask around cost or is it something else? It may be multiple. I'd love to get your perspective on what's top of mind when it comes to thinking about getting more and better access to information. So thanks, I see, I see answers coming in through the chat already. And with that, what I would tell you is I'm going to turn it over uh, back to Shannon to, to take it away from here. But if you'd like to learn more, our, our website's here. You can try it, demo it, anything you want, or and take a look at some of our recent data. So uh, with that, thank you for the time. And over to you, Shannon. Courtney, thank you so much. And to thanks to Chaos Search for sponsoring today's webinar and helping to make these webinars happen. Always a pleasure to have you here. If you have questions for Courtney, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion um, as she will be joining us in the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar today. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for this series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. And with that, I'll give the floor to William to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello, and thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Courtney, uh, for that great review of Chaos Search. Uh, glad to have you uh, back aboard here. And I trust that my slides are being shown correctly. If not, chime on in. But if so, uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, the talk today by saying I'm going to be talking about data architecture, best practices for analytic and advanced analytics 
And I am going to be talking about analytics. So we're going to focus on that uh, sort of that post-operational data. Okay, data that's already done its transaction, done its operation, and now it's, it, uh, it, it, it has a record of history that we need to capture in our analytic ecosystem. And that's exactly what it is today. It's an ecosystem and no two are the same especially with the stacks getting so complicated and so voluminous in terms of the things that we need to pull off a great stack. Okay, so I have 12 best practices for you today. Uh, I figured 12 was about right so that I'm not rapid fire throwing best practices at you. And uh, we get to, uh, to sit with each best practice for just a little bit, which I hope will help them to, to sink in and help you to think about them, agree or disagree. Uh, again, my perspective, but um, let's move on. Okay, let's go. There we go. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I run a data strategy and implementation consulting firm. I've been in consulting now for 25 or so years. Uh, all in the space of data. Of course, that has evolved quite a bit over the years. So I've seen a lot. Started with a lot of data warehousing, analytics, and BI. That's still relevant today, by the way, but it has uh, it only expanded. The envelope for data has only expanded. As a matter of fact, to uh, Courtney's question earlier, uh, my answer was data. That is the impediment to, to, uh, to success. So we'll see if you agree as we go along here. All right, so one principle I want to start with here is it's about all data. It's about all your data in the enterprise and the relevant data from third parties as well. We don't talk enough about third party data today. I think there's tremendous value uh, opportunity in third party data, but I'm going to leave that at, at, at that. Uh, that could probably be a best practice to take a look into that marketplace. But anyway, let's get all your data under management and let's start to uh, erode the edges of this chart where we have data that's not under management and we have <clears throat> data that is uh, maybe, um, it's not even being considered to be brought under management. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by this. This is a, this is a foundation of, of my implementations, a foundation of, of uh, uh, philosophy, I guess, as I look at data architectures and so on. So it's something that I thought I'd put up here in the beginning. Some of you may have heard me say this before because it's, it's definitely something that I talk about a lot. I think that we need to get the data under management so that the business can utilize uh, that data. And uh, you may get, uh, you may, I, I may hear some pushback at this point about, well, the business isn't asking for it. It's not asking for all that data, just some of the data, or just this part of the data, or just summary data, et cetera, et cetera. Then I think you concurrent with that activity of getting all data under management, which I'm not backing off of, uh, you need to kind of be working on the business side of things as well and helping them understand the possibilities. Because today, so here's another thing. It's not all about just following on to business priorities and so on. That is great, but it's also about data professionals like people who come to this webinar shaping what that business direction should be because we're gonna have all this knowledge about data that others don't have. Best practice, get all data under management. Okay, so what does that mean? It's under management when it is the following. It's in a leverageable platform. Okay, it's in a platform that is built for uh, leverage, built for multiple applications, not built for one application only. And that's, this doesn't mean that there won't, that those structures won't exist, they surely will. But I would like to see all data be somewhere in a leverageable platform so that if, if a department wants special consideration for their transformations, if they have special security requirements, et cetera, if they, have, if they throw up all kinds of impediments to doing it this way, fine, we, we at least have the data someplace in a leverageable platform. And then we maybe push it to, to their uh, special platform uh, as appropriate. Data is under management when it's in an appropriate platform for its profile and usage. We are not 
in the day and age when there is one size fits all, meaning all data. There's definitely a difference between performance of analytics and operations in different databases. And databases are engineered for one or the other most of the time, not all the time. Uh, and that is true for a lot of the surrounding uh, 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 elements of the platform, not just the, you know, the platform itself where the data resides, the storage. Data is under management when it has high non-functionals. Specifically, it's available, it performs well, to purpose, it's scalable, it's stable, people can count on it, it's durable, and it's secure today. It's captured at the most granular level. It meets a data quality standard. It's defined by data governance, not defined by us uh, technical people who in enjoy doing such things, but by data governance. And so almost always, I will say, if, if I'm implementing a data warehouse, a data lake, a master data management hub, what have you, data governance needs to be enhanced for that particular activity. And sometimes it just needs to be started, which is you know, that means uh, more work before we get to the, the quote unquote real work, right? Uh, data governance must be there for these things. And it enables self-service. Empower everyone with true self-service analytics, not just expert fed insights. We're not over here finding out the insights and, and you know, metering them out to the business. Hopefully we're doing some of that, but that's not it. That can't be it. We need to empower the business to interact with the data. And we need to do that by delivering engaging, data-driven user experiences, not just simplistic transactional user experiences. We need to be delivering user experiences that allow for continued access to the data, where the data can be queried, it can be queried again and again and again, and you can drill and drill and drill and Heck, maybe not ever, ever even really get to the end of the data because you know you just keep drilling in circles because you're learning and learning and learning. And sooner or later, with that approach, the business gets to real insights, which need to be operationalized for action, not just put into things like reports and dashboards, which are kind of going by the wayside in terms of big time interest out there amongst the user communities that I follow. So here's the best practice, empower everyone with true self-service. Let's get out of that game. We builders, whether you're IT or not, whether you're central IT or not, we builders need to get out of the way between users and their data. Well, there's plenty more work for us. Hopefully you'll see that a little bit here today. Here's a quote, 80% of analyst time is spent simply discovering and preparing data. And this was from 2017. And you know what? It's still pretty true today. It may not quite be 80%. I don't know how this is measured, but it's certainly very high. And I know even a data scientist job is pretty high in terms of discovering and preparing data. That means that we have not built it once so that it can be used many times. We haven't done a great job with data architectures out there. And that is really where we need to focus. That's where the big leverage comes from. And I know you got the got the day-to-day -day deadlines, you got the day-to-day you know, phone calls and so on, maybe Slack today, give me this report, give me that report. We got to do that. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be adhering to our higher calling in the organization, which is to raise the foundation and get out of that game. So here's the best practice. Start getting concerned with the tools and processes of the analysts. How are they accessing the data? How can we facilitate that access to the data? How can we perhaps if there's a better way that they can access data, how can we change that? How can we change that? We, we shouldn't be just leaving all the user community to their own devices in terms of how they access data uh, because they're under those same deadlines I just mentioned, right? They just turn, kind of turn around and <laughs> give it to us as well, right? But they're under those deadlines, which is why we are, right? But they're under those deadlines and they may not be thinking in, uh, how, how, how should you say, uh, system two thinking. I like that system one versus system two thinking. We kind of all, all are always in system one thinking. And I'd like to think I bring you a little bit of system two thinking here to go back and uh, mull over. Now, we're building up to the structures that are relevant to our analytics. The relational data page, which I won't go into great detail here, except to say you got all the records there on the page. And they're in order, uh, in some kind of order, if you've 
clustered the, the table. Uh, if not, they're in, they're in some kind of uh, random order, uh, but we know where they are because of the row IDs at the end of the page. And that's how the data manager of the DBMS navigates the page to bring us back record that's on the record that's on page number 100, uh, record number two. Well, there it is. That's how they kind of do that. So it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's been around since the 1970s. And here, let's add another row. We add a row ID, we add the record. Again, beautiful thing, works great. And uh, nothing has supplanted the relational data page as being the preeminent way to store uh, uh, enterprise data. Yes, it's been around quite a while. Well, what else has been around since the 1970s? Let's think about email, the microprocessor, ethernet, post-it notes, uh, and the mobile phones, which weren't very mobile back then, but nonetheless, the relational data page um, has um, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, neat things about it. And it's kind of like the QWERTY keyboard, right? Um, we we kind of all know the story of, the, of, our, of our keyboards under our fingertips right now, probably, where that was the, uh, the most inefficient way to design it so that uh, the keys didn't, didn't mash. But I guess it's the most efficient way to do it now because that's how we have learned and how we've passed it down to our children and in our genes and so on, perhaps as well. So the relational data page, now let me give you a little twist to it. That's the columnar orientation. I cannot, I cannot talk about the relational data page without talking about the columnar orientation. So if you're going to be relational and you're doing analytics, those structures almost always in my experience, what I found almost always are optimized as columnar. So here's the best practice for you. Make all analytic structure columnar. And you can do some quick tests. Uh, to figure this out. Maybe you don't have a columnar database. Well, that's maybe problem number one. Um, maybe you don't have columnar capabilities within your relational database, or you don't know how to use them, or some such, such thing. These are problem number ones. Um, but usually, they work. this works best for analytic structure, where you get to deal with uh, a single uh, column at a time instead of the whole record, kind of like on iTunes, you can go and play, you can go and buy one song. Uh, you don't have to buy the whole album. And uh, that's a beautiful thing too. So uh, columnar orientation has been around for quite a while. The, the, the history is interesting. And it, if anybody wants to look into it uh, quickly though, in the early 1990s, Expressway Technologies this developed the Expressway 103 which is a, was a column-based engine optimized for analytics that would eventually become Sybase IQ. Anybody remember Sybase IQ? Sybase acquired Expressway and reintroduced the product in, the 19, in 1995 as IQ Accelerator. I remember that. Then renamed it shortly thereafter to Sybase IQ. And the story goes on and on. Now pretty much most analytic databases have columnar capabilities. So take advantage of them. Now. Data lakes. Yeah, this is where uh, we need to focus a lot of time and energy. I know we still got to shore up our data warehouses, but we've been ignoring big data. We've been uh, underutilizing big data and uh, big data, you know, kind of being defined as special and different uh, in, in many ways, right? More of it, uh, more different, uh, different data types in there uh, and so on. It's like streaming data. Mostly it's uh, data that just accumulates very, very rapidly. It's not tied to a, a quote unquote business transaction. And so data lakes are kind of the, in the terminology that seem, the industry seems to have taken up. I don't necessarily like it, but uh, I got to go with it because I want you to, to be able to follow along um, after this presentation. Everything you're going to hear uh, most of the time it's data lakes uh, is whatever we're doing to cloud storage. S3, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's what we're talking about and how they're normally organized is in the upper left here. There's a record. It has a record length and a key length that has the key and it has the value, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the record may or may not be compressed. That's a big deal. 
and matters a lot, but we won't go into that in great detail. What we do like is the parquet format to our data lakes for analytics. And most data lakes are for analytics. There are such things as operational data lakes. We built them, that's great as well. But most of the time when we refer to the data lake, it's an analytic structure that kind of sits uh, in the architecture alongside the data warehouses. It's conceptually very much, to me anyway, like a data warehouse, just different data. And obviously different you know, price structure, uh, it's better for big data, period. Big data is competitive data today. We must get a handle on that. And by the way, the, since the data is sitting out there in data lakes and we're gonna have so much more going there, we do need to be able to access it. We need to be able to index it. We need to be able to search it efficiently. And that's where tools like Chaos Search come into play, which is why we love that tool. So here's your best practice. Put big data in data lakes. Here's another best practice. Rapid fire. Index the data lake. Okay. So you got your data lakes. Hopefully they're architected pretty well. Uh, they're not necessarily, well, let me bring up the slide. They're not necessarily brought to the same level of governance and quality than is the data warehouse. But I suggest that the lack of data governance, I'm going to the last bullet here first, the lack of data governance, you do that at peril uh, to the data lake. You need to bring some data governance to the data lake and understand where maybe, you're, maybe, where maybe you haven't applied consciously, where you haven't applied data quality rules, where you haven't uh, you know, applied real data governance and hopefully erode that over time. Catalog, data catalogs are really good for this, really helpful to uh, data lakes, to understanding them. I'm almost to the word mandatory, but I'm just gonna say very helpful. Data lakes are common and centralized storage for the enterprise. There is no defined data model into which the data is formed, no relationships. It's, that's, it's a great place for historical data retention. We don't talk enough about historical data retention. You have to have data that's available to the user community. They need that data going back a certain number of years, no doubt about it. Um, prior to where they need that data going back to, you got to store it someplace. Well, you don't have to really worry about it if the data is in a data lake because it's such low cost storage. I would just keep all history there for all time, not worry about having different tiers of data, but in the data warehouse, you do have to be concerned about that. And uh, perhaps the data lake is a good place to put some of that historical data as well. Again, don't just shovel things in here. Do it mindfully, do it under catalog, do it under governance. All data formats can go in the data lake. It is for big data. Hopefully I've made that point. It is mostly analytical processing. As I've said today, it's mostly data scientists and coming on, on board really quick, as best as I can tell is, is the data analyst, uh, if you will. And uh, more and more, we're going to have to curate and understand what goes in the data lake and how it's being used so that we can do a better job as builders for our users, which are becoming so much more diverse. Now, I'm not gonna be, I'm not, I don't wanna fool anybody. The data in the data lake is less valuable per capita than the data warehouse meaning any given random terabyte that you pull out of the data lake, it's not gonna be as valuable as the terabyte in, the, in a data warehouse, that's okay. Again, different pricing models uh, and different purposes. And over time, I think uh, we may get to the point where our data science within our organization says that all of this data is equally very highly valuable. Graph databases. Yeah, there's a finite set of structures that your analytic data should be in when it comes to best practices. I am at the end of that list right now, as I say graph databases. So uh, graph databases, uh, a little bit of their background in the mid 1960s. Navigational databases such as IBM's IMS, remember that, uh, supported tree-like structures in its hierarchical model but the strict tree structure could be circumvented with virtual records. Graph structures could be represented in network model databases from the late 60s. Yeah, and they've been around. They've been around, but they've only come into uh, the big time, I would say, in the last few years, where we have learned that this sort of network data within the organization is uh, important, and it must be navigated quickly. 
and efficiently. And that is not done in a relational database. I have tried, maybe you have tried as well, to force feed graph data uh, into relational databases. Heck, I've tried to force feed big data into relational databases and done an okay job with it for the time, but now you've got to use the tools of the trade. And uh, graph databases, I'm not going to go on and on about them or about the other tools, but they are definitely a tool for you to be using for your sizable connected data. I had to throw the word sizable in there. There's a lot of relational databases now that will do an okay job with, with graph uh, algorithms uh, like betweenness and things like that. Betweenness centrality uh, is, is a big one showing you know the, the path between two nodes in the network, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, um, so you may find that you can get away with using some of that. Um, check it out. There, that would be equivalent to a graph database for you. So graph databases, we've got graph databases, we've got data lakes, we've got data warehouses, we have other analytic structure that's in relational databases. Now, because we have so much, and you're probably thinking, what about this, what about that? Yeah, I'm thinking about it too, but it's not worth bringing up right now the other things uh, at this level, but whatever, we have to uh, uh, access some of this data uh, that's in multiple structures at once. And so data virtualization, just want to slip this in there, how important that is in these new architectures. That's the best practice. Enable data virtualization for edge and temporary needs. Yeah, not all needs, but for your edge needs where you happen to have data in multiple structures and you need it in one query, great. Uh, and maybe you're in process of architecting that together, which is always going to give you the best performance. But it's okay to have some queries go to data virtualization in the modern enterprise analytics stack, which is right here. I'm showing you the modern stack. And I've had other webinars that are completely devoted to this stack and explaining each and every one of them. Um, let me see if there's any I want to call out here. Dedicated compute is going to be your highest costly one. Storage is up there as well, data integration. Sometimes you have to go to a third party. And speaking of third parties, here's the best practice for you. Drum roll, leverage, best of breed for your analytics stack. You don't have to go all in with whatever AWS provides or whatever Azure provides or whatever Google provides. Yeah, they may not like me saying that, but you may bring some tools to the party that you're already uh, very skilled in for number one, okay? So that might be one reason to swap out something in their, in their stack for you. But some of, I mean, some things are just best of breed and they don't fall under those categories. And that should be perfectly fine. And by the way, I just mentioned three stacks. There are a few others that are you know, more or less complete as well. And there's heterogeneous stacks galore out there, okay? So notice that I have slipped in data catalog. I have slipped in data virtualization identity management, machine learning, their set of libraries and so on. I think the others may be a little bit more evident, but uh, I think there's 11 things here. They're kind of all required for most, most of your big time enterprise machine learning uh, applications. And remember, total cost of ownership is more than just the cloud costs. There's the cost of administrating it, the lack of platform features, it leads to more work for workarounds. Uh, that's definitely true when it comes to data lakes, when you've moved from the data warehouse environment and performance uh, impacts cost of ownership as well. So best practice, get a strong handle on your cloud costs. I've given complete webinars dedicated to cloud costs and how to, <clears throat> how to look at them, how to understand them, how to manage them. So check that out. And and definitely do that. <clears throat> data integration, best practices now for analytics. There are some capabilities for data integration that you need to have. You have to ask yourself, here's, a, here's an example of best of breed in the stack, right? You have to ask yourself whether AWS Glue, et cetera, et cetera, whether those provide enough for you for your enterprise data integration needs. Because they don't... Those tools don't do all of what I'm showing you here without getting into back and forth. 
Now here's some of the tools and we've done full <clears throat> evaluations of these tools. And here's our NetNet, Cloudera, uh, IBM Informatica Talent for anything. Uh, uh, what else we have for anything? Matillion, Matillion for anything uh, within our contained project scope, I would say. Uh, that's true for some of the other data prep vendors, but I think there's a role here for them in an enterprise uh, alongside these enterprise data integration tools. I don't, I'm not trying to over tool anybody, but uh, there, there are needs and there is no one size fits all. And that's true for data integration as well. So your best practice, use fit for purpose, data integration, not one size fits all. Don't think about it as one size fits all. Yeah, it's not as bad, if you will, as the data management platform for which you will have several. You might just have two here, but uh, I'm saying that you will have at least two and that's okay. Competitive analytic architectures. Okay. And by the way, I'm giving these examples today. Uh, I'm not trying to exclude anybody. I'm not trying to exclude the great other stacks that there are out there. Okay. Architecture component needs security, privacy. That's a big one. Governance and compliance availability, et cetera, et cetera. I want to get to some other slides. Here's a analytics reference architecture. So you can see that we, 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 we load the data lake. We also load the data warehouse. I like to use the data lake as staging for the data warehouse. What does that imply? That implies all data in the data warehouse is in the data lake as well. That implies that my historical data is safe and secure in the data lake and cost effective in the data lake. So I can age off my data warehouse if I want to, if I want to, data over a few years old and not have to worry about it. I got it. It's in the data lake. It's not as accessible there. And we might have to bring data virtualization to bear a time or two after we do that, but that's okay. Notice how we take our big data, our low latency data, we stream that into the lake, but we use ETL or ELT as the case may be, probably more likely ELT for loading batch data, relational data, structured data, et cetera, into our data lake. There I show you S3 as an example. Uh, and I show you Parquet. So S3 turned as Parquet. Parquet does apply to other kinds of structures, in this case, in the data lake. We're saying it applies to the S3. And then we can stream or ETL or what have you into the data warehouse. You have choices there. The data warehouse, you might create some data in the data warehouse that you want to offload into the data lake, and that's fine. You might have some reach through queries from the warehouse into the lake which some of you are picking up that that is the data lake house notion, right? Okay, now let me introduce the lake house and some of the other constructs that we're hearing about lately. It's very exciting, very exciting. Data lake house, the terminology comes from Databricks, right? Okay, it's the idea of the lake and the warehouse working together. All points of integration are points of failure, so you wanna be careful. But these data lakes have emerged to handle raw data in a variety of formats on cheap storage for data science and machine learning. So there is a, a skill to what data goes where or what data, really the skill is what data will go on to the data warehouse. And I talked about virtualization and the fact that, well, you kind of want your data together most of the time. And so it is important to, to carefully cultivate what data moves from the lake to the warehouse. But we're talking about the lake house right now. We're talking about the other way. We're talking about queries. The queries for the lake house start at the warehouse when it needs more data or reach into the lake and simply bring that to bear on the query. And that's the basic notion of the data lake house. It is uh, more difficult than it sounds maybe to, to set up to make sure that the lake understands uh, or excuse me, the query understands what data is where and can connect that data up appropriately between the two structures, okay? Um, and this is where, you know, you want something like a Databricks that is already uh, ensured that that will happen appropriately. All the major data platform vendors have converged their messaging around this concept though. It takes the best attributes of traditional data warehouses, enables them to run on platforms with data lake storage architecture. So the data warehouse might have S3, but I'm still calling it 
this is tricky, okay? Follow me, and I, and I hope, I'm trying not to confuse you, but um, some data warehouses do sit on cloud storage. However, I could still call them a data warehouse. We can still call them a relational because of how the data is structured on the cloud storage. How is the structured? I showed you a few slides ago in that relational format. And of course, it's important that SQL works directly upon that data. All right, you've been hearing about this, the data mesh. Yeah, the data mesh. The mesh and the fabric, which is next, uh, are architectural patterns for data management that are decentralized. And to me, decentralized, it's, you don't, you don't want it as a purist, but it's almost inevitable, okay? So I look at the data mesh idea, uh, which by the way, is not attached to a vendor like Databricks to the data, to the lake house. It's consultant led. Uh, I'm not sure where its origins came from. I just suddenly started hearing a lot about it. And uh, looking at it, um, it is uh, something that I can tell already, or I can tell pretty quickly that, a lot of my implementations have sort of backed their way into looking like this by default, right? Just out of necessity to have multiple warehouses, multiple lakes, multiple ETL pipelines, if you will. Um, and how were they, but in the, in the quote unquote mesh, how is it done? It's done by domain. So you have different warehouses, lakes and integrations for different quote unquote domains. Uh, Domains are typically business domains, like a business department. Um, but domains can be other things like uh, marketing, sales, HR, uh, or you can organize it a little bit differently. The point is not what it's organized by. The point is that it is decentralized and there are multiple structures working together, but multiple structures. This enables flexibility in design, especially for self-service. And uh, it does have some challenges, right? Because you don't have the enterprise level uh, necessarily recognized in here. So you may have that as one of the domains, okay? Maybe you don't want to ignore it to that level. So governance, security, availability, recovery, performance can be difficult, uh, but it's, it is flexible in design for self-service. You just may have to work around the shortcomings because I think a data mesh is definitely uh, the idea is here to stay. So I look forward to some best practices coming out about data meshes. I look forward to contributing to best practices around data meshes because I definitely see this as something that is sort of a, an acknowledgement of the reality. Now let's move on to the data fabric. Now I don't have a great way to draw the data fabric. I have not seen a great way to draw the data fabric. So I threw a fabric over the architecture and hopefully that uh, conveys the message uh, good enough for now. But a fabric is you got your architecture there. It looks like these looks like the lake house uh, a bit here. But the fabric provides common shared services, connectivity and application portability. It's all about the use of metadata to enable the data to inform its own management and governance. So big challenge here is in making sure that we capture the metadata. Uh, oftentimes, architectures have not captured metadata, do not have great metadata, and therefore, they are behind the wheel when it comes to trying to get to a data fabric. But uh, nonetheless, it can be done. I, I like the idea of the fabric, and um, I like the idea of the automation that's inherent within the fabric, the fabric working on the data in the background. When you think about rule A, you think about rule B because it's automatic different things are happening automatically within the uh, confines of the fabric. It utilizes the continued flow of data over all metadata assets to provide insights and recommendations. So I, I'm really liking the idea of the data speaking for itself. And uh, I was at the ThoughtSpot conference this week. I brought this up many times that uh, we want the data to start, we want processes to start working on the data in the background and telling us more, telling us more about what we should be focused on, not doing all of, not just sitting there, sitting there statically. And so uh, the data mesh has these engines running on the data in the background, which is great. We'll, we look forward to seeing more of this. Data virtualization is like a logical data fabric. Uh, data fabric comes from different places, but IBM is 
one company that's all over it. And uh, they're clearly a bellwether company, so we have to pay attention. By the way, you cannot do either a mesh or a fabric effectively without enterprise level data and what I might call master data management. How do you answer the question? How many customers are there when you have these decentralized architectures? Well, again, that's something that you want to take care of as well. Context, context matters to the business departments, but you must have a place for overall answers. So mesh and fabric, pursue mesh and fabric architectures to the degree possible. Um, that's a carefully worded, I know it's a bit murky and high level kind of best practice, but that's as best as I can do right now because we have to uh, do some waiting and seeing and uh, this is a general best practice. Each of you, I might advise a more specific best practice around a mesh or a fabric or neither. Um, but I think generally speaking, I can say this with confidence. And finally, we have the data cloud from Snowflake, right? where everything is a cloud service. The data cloud allows organizations to unify and connect to a single copy of all their data. The result is an ecosystem of thousands of businesses and organizations connecting to not only their own data, but also to each other by effortlessly sharing and consuming shared data and data services. The cloud makes the vast and growing quantities of valuable data connected, accessible, and available. It looks a little bit more integrated to me, than the lake house, but in reality, it may be more complex and expensive. Data science is only supported with new clusters. In fact, almost every additional demand of performance scale or analytics can only be met by adding new resources at a price. It's more integrated than the lake house, like I mentioned, but in reality, more complex and expensive. You're continually spinning up new clusters. Best practice uh, around this is to do an ELT into Snowflake, and then transition that data using SQL into a Snowflake data warehouse. Every client will buy an ETL tool for this, Matillion, Fivetran, uh, Informatica, et cetera, to load Snowflake. Um, this does take advantage of things like cloud security, mostly at a pass-through level. Again, if you can get past the expense of it all and you can set this up, not a bad way to go. I'm not, gonna, I'm not really saying it's, it's, a, it's a bad thing. Um, I think I would, I, I think most organizations would definitely give an arm and a leg to have a great data cloud up and running today, as they would a data mesh, as they would a data fabric, or a data lake house, or different of the above. You can have lake houses and fabrics <laughs> and meshes all at once. I don't know about throwing the cloud in, in on that one. But you can under this cloud, you could definitely have some of those things as well. I hopefully haven't confused you too much, but uh, this is all kind of getting sorted out. This is all new stuff. Data cloud hasn't been around that long, uh, maybe a year, the idea of it anyway, from, from Snowflake. Uh, they are providing uh, more and more best practices as time goes on. We're seeing more and more customers that are doing more and more with this. I wouldn't say anybody is fully there. Uh, I think that's a fair statement. I think that's an okay statement to make, right? Um, but uh, once once they are, I think they'll they'll be adding on to it because I think it is uh, it is great as well. So in summary, get all enterprise data under management, relational databases, especially cloud, cloud storage, especially Parquet, and Graph cover most analytic platform needs. Cost of ownership is more than the cloud cost. Get a handle on that. Data integration is vital to data architecture for modern analytics. That's why I spent some time on it here today. You can't just put the data structures in place in a best practice way without the data flowing in a best practice way. Okay, and that's great data integration. Data integration, data prep, streaming data, what have you. The data mesh and data fabric are decentralizing the architecture and acknowledging reality and it's a, it's a great thing. So I did recommend pursuing them. Um, I have a couple of uh, offerings there at the bottom of the page that we do that's related to the concepts that were discussed today. And also, I, I think I fail to mention most of the time on these presentations, but I'll give anybody uh, out there a free half an hour with me to talk about your situation. Um, no, uh, how, do you, how do you say it? No obligation necessary or whatever, <laughs> but just get in touch with me. Happy to talk about these things. I learned too. 
our upcoming topics in this series. I can't wait to next month, one of my favorite topics. I like this one too, but is our information management mature? Everybody's asking about maturity. How are we mature? How are we compared to our, our peers and so on? Well, let me give you some guidelines around that. The future based on AI and analytics. I really like that one. That one's going to be, I'm going to be a, go a little bit astray of the, uh, the pure technical aspect and take a look at the future. Uh, we're all going to live into the future to some degree. So let's learn about it. Organizational change management is going to be out there. Graph database use cases. Oh, there it is. And then assessing new databases, the translytical use cases, those cases that are both operational and analytical, eroding what I said before about there being different databases for, for operational and analytical. But that's, uh, that's how things are going. Some of, the best some of the best practices, by the way, that you saw today, you will see them again next month in the mature environment talk. Why is that? because I have found that mature environments actually do these things. And so when I sh share with you the model, you're gonna see that uh, they're correlated to some of the things I said today. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my formal presentation. I'll turn it back over to Shannon and Courtney and I will now take your questions. I love it. Thank you so much, William, for another great presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session and anything else requested throughout. So diving in here. So data virtualization introduces very complex views and breaks the idea of having modular code to debug and analyze. So why would one um, pursue this knowledge, this knowing the drawbacks? Well, I'll take a, a first shot at it here um, since I brought it up in my presentation. Um, yeah, I, I, th I hope I put the right words around the utilization of data virtualization because I, I essentially agree uh, with the question and uh, don't want to see it over, overly done, right? But uh, when you're moving fast, as enterprises are, you're going to have those edge cases where oh, if you didn't load this data set in the data warehouse, yet you need to access it along with uh, the 80% of data for the query that is in the data warehouse. So what are you going to do? You're going to wait a month for, you know, a turnaround of loading that data set. A month is probably pretty generous, I think, in a lot of enterprises. Maybe it's more like two or three. No, you can't do that. Uh, so data virtualization saves the day there. So you don't want to you don't want to be trying to implement data virtualization on the fly here uh, in response to something like this. You probably won't. As a matter of fact, you'll probably go ahead and load the data set. <laughs> Okay, so you don't want to have that, you don't, you don't want to spend that month, uh, you want to do it now, you want to do it as part of your core architecture so that you can take advantage of those situations and, and, and be, be responsive. I think it's, I think it's, you know, definitely it's, it's incumbent upon us to be uh, uber responsive uh, to the business, and this is just part of that to me. Anything up there yet? No, I think William's answer on that one was was great. I love it. So lots of great questions that coming in here. So uh, what is your view on using graph databases versus columnar? Um, they're two different things. Um, they're four different data. Uh, graph is for connected data, relationship data, network data. Um, Things like uh, the, you know the Twitter graph, how we're all connected to each other. Things like maps, where you're connecting nodes uh, on the Earth to create efficient pathing, uh, where you're finding out relationships uh, between between people, between customers, between parts, what have you. Things like that. Columnar is just simply uh, analytic relational database. It should be columnar because they'll only access the columns that are needed for the query. Uh, in an IO, which is very expensive. So um, I, don't, I don't think the concept of columnar applies necessarily to graph data. I showed you real quick, but I showed you on the slide the, uh, the RDF format for graph data, which is uh, what's called a triple store uh, subject and predicate uh, in, the, in, the, in the triple, if you will, and um, subject predicate object. And so um, that's how that data is structured. And so they're, they're just different.
Perfect. And Courtney, I'll just let you jump in whenever um, for these questions. Sure. Um, so can you explain your comment that you need MDM before data mesh and fabric and why? Yeah, I'd be happy to because uh, I want everybody to know this and uh, happy to underscore what I had said before about uh, the importance of master data management. Now, I've given a full webinar on the importance of master data management, so uh, you can you can find out a little bit more about what I what I think about it uh, in that webinar if you want to hunt that up. But I think it's just really important uh, to an enterprise where you know data has been determined to be important. This is a, a an elegant way of managing that data. Now, that being said, uh, in conjunction with a mesh or a fabric, I think we have to be careful in that even without MDM. Uh, you know, folks have enterprise level data somewhere, even without a mesh or a fabric. But if you go with a mesh or a fabric, you, may, you have the option, I guess, of not having anything at the enterprise level because everything is decentralized and out uh, at the department level or some other, some other domain that you've established level. And that is where you, you are just, that's where you're going to have a hole in your capabilities. Uh, I don't think virtualization is the answer there. I think MDM is the answer there to have it physically manifested and up to date in real time and accessible and probably pushed out to the applications that need that kind of data. And that's what MDM does. So that's why I'm high on MDM, uh, if you will, and uh, believe that it's a, a very important special concept when we're talking about decentralized architectures like mesh and fabric. Perfect. So, and what are your thoughts on data lake house, combining data warehouse and data lake? Yeah, well, um, I'm, I, I, it's very important. I, I think you should do it. Um, absolutely. Um, make those structures work together. Uh, you're going to need both. I hopefully established uh, a little bit here today uh, about the need for both of those structures for different types of data. Uh, in the organization and in order to get all data under management. So you're going to need both uh, best for them to work together in, in harmony. And uh, again, again, it's, it's, it's another way of providing great service to the business and being ready for anything that comes up uh, within the data. So it's kind of like a virtualization concept, right? But, but it's special because it's, it combines the data warehouse and the data lake. And we've got, if you yeah, and I guess, could I, I'll chime in, Shannon, on that one too, this, yeah. I mean, we, we spend so much time talking about all, all four of the things, right? The lake, oh, really five, right? The warehouse, the lake, the lake house, the mesh, the fabric. And I guess I, I, I'm echoing William's comment that there's room for both things. I think that you see a lot of opportunity and like, what is the macro problem here? Data is is both diverse in in its type. It's diverse in where it persists. It's diverse in the type of groups that are trying to to derive questions. You know, drive answers. I guess the thing I would say is when it comes to a lake or lake house, it you know it doesn't have to be, or or a warehouse or a lake house. I think was a question. It it doesn't have to be one or the other, but there is a like an awareness point for enterprises around trying to drive towards simplicity, right? Which is. Yeah. People aren't going to want to have a mesh, a fabric, a warehouse, a lake house, a lake. Like, I don't think that's really our end game. But what is important is that, our, you know, is everybody here really thinking through where are the greatest needs for data within my business? What is the best way for me to answer a couple of questions, right? So that you have something that's like extensible in its, in its structure and then, and then move towards that. So it's not, it's not only a one thing, but it's also not an everything answer. I love it. So I'm going to, again, so, um, see, what about data vault? Uh, what about data vault? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Very popular in Europe, by the way. Um, I mean, I, that's, that's a, a modeling technique that can work with any of the above and um, not better or worse in any of the above, just a modeling technique that has been uh, you know, decided upon. Personally, I don't pursue vaults in my implementations. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just because you know, I'm good with uh, straight up uh, Kimball approaches to data modeling and, 
And uh, I, I do like the idea of the idea behind it to get all data. Um, but I think you can do that in other structures as well. So um, again, a modeling technique, not necessarily a architecture best practice, but um, something that you can work with uh, within all the others. Um, not something I'm going to raise to a best practice. Though. Love it. Well, thank you both so much for these great presentations. And thanks to Chaos Search for sponsoring today's webinar. Again, helping to make these webinars happen. Always appreciate it. And great to have you uh, with us again, Courtney. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything that we do. Um, just a reminder, I will send it again, I will send a, a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Um, so thank you, everybody. Hope you all have a great day as well. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks, William.